In 1705, Thomas Newcomen, a Devonshire ironmonger, designed his first practical steam engine. It was first used. A pump rod hung from the outer end of a beam. This beam was pivoted in its center. From the inner end of the beam hung a chain and rod which passed through the open top of a brass cylinder. The end of the rod was connected to a piston. Newcomen's principles of a beam and a piston which moved inside a cylinder proved to be the basic design for many later engines. For more than 70 years, Newcomen's atmospheric engines with their open top cylinders reigned supreme. They were used for pumping water from the coal and lead mines in the north of England and from the tin and copper mines in the west. They were employed in cities to supply water. The valve gear of these early engines sometimes had to be worked by hand. Even today, more than 200 years after Newcomen's death in 1729, a few of his engines still exist. This one, built in 1787 at Elsicar in the north of England, and with slight modifications, can still be worked. A memorial to the first man to make a practical steam engine, Thomas Newcomen. Last week, Joe and I took one of our modified six-wheel drive jobs out for a special run. Joe was driving this time while I watched points from the sidelines. The main idea was to have a final check-up on the clearance around the wheels during articulation. A six-wheel drive can be engaged when crossing rough or difficult country. This type of suspension enables the front wheels to follow the ground without upsetting the trim, so that the load on both front wheels remains more or less equal. Deeply cut treads and broad low-pressure tyres give improved grip and help to prevent foundering in marshy ground. Cross-country performance, equal to that of a half-track vehicle, is made possible by the exceptional clearance amidships, hence the high build of the vehicle. Well, there seems to be plenty of clearance there. I was satisfied, and so was Joe. So I sent him off again for a thorough test of the power-assisted steering, the idea being to check up on the amount of compressed air used. Yes, you need a bit of help on the steering with about five tons on the front axle, once you get off the beaten track, that is. Just the job. Dead easy. Even for a lightweight like me. And now for a bit of mud. Ooh. Bit sticky around here. Better try putting her in a second. So, here we go. That's it. That's done the trick. taking her through this little lot. After all, that's what she's built for.
fins, streamlined bonnets, rear stabilizer fins, steering wheel bindings for better hand grip at high speeds, steering gear using chain and sprocket linkage with trailing radius arm or traction steering, leading radius arm, floating axles, suspensions fixed or independent. All cars competing are classified according to a rating based on a one youth power formula. Hello, looks like transmission trouble. Soon fixed though, and so on with the race. And now for the lightweight class, the Wolf Cup the 500cc racing drivers of tomorrow, and the mechanics, and pit attendants too. And so, forward to the finals at Brighton, where we're just in time to see the finish of the Wolf Cup class. Well, there's a record crowd here today of 90,000 lining the course for the National Soapbox Derby. And now the cars are lined up for the big race. They're under starter's orders now. Everyone very tense. On the rails, Tolworth Tortoise. Then Brumus. Galcador. And then the favourite, a soapbox named Desire. And they're off. And Brumus jumps straight into the lead with Tortoise second and the favourite Desire badly away. It's a scorching face they've set right from the start. Now the Tortoise spurts into the lead with Galcador coming up very fast on the outside. He's past Brumus, and now Galcador leads the field by nearly a length from Torres, with Brumus hot on their heels. Now Brumus is really turning on the heat. He's throwing in everything, except the kitchen stove, of course. It's a cracking face. Galcador and the Torres fighting it out toe to toe, and Torres forging ahead. But Brumus is still there too, and as the cars come flashing down the straight with four furlongs to go, it's anybody's race. Now it's neck and neck, Torres and Galcador, with Brumus close up for desire nowhere. 50 yards to go, and Tortoise is still leading, but Galcador puts in a desperate spurt. It's a fight to the finish, and what a finish. The fans go wild with excitement as Galcador wins. Now it's Tortoise. I can't see. Do stand back there, please. 